did you hear that? Oh, my neck cracked. I'm glad that happened at the beginning of the show. I feel great now. Oh, man. Here we go. We're on the air. We got a good one today, too. Tony Hinchcliffe's calling in. I've been wanting to talk to Tony for a while about what happened to him, falling victim to a really sad attempt at being canceled by a fellow comedian. If you're familiar with this, I'm, I'm talking about when he had a guy open up for him who basically tattletailed on him to Twitter. Yeah, yeah, and the guy went on a full-on uh, media tour in China <laughs> for calling him the C-word on stage. Yeah, a guy Tony had tour with him who was basically his friend. The guy's entire set was trash and white people, and then Tony goes up there, plays off of it. Anyway, it turned into a whole thing. We're going to get Tony's side of the story and talk about some other stuff, so stick around for that. Yeah, his buddy Joe's going through it too. Who would have thought Joe Rogan would be public enemy number one? Well, when you live in a society that decides that context or intent doesn't matter anymore, and you have news outlets in the business of crafting smear campaigns against people whose views don't align with their narrative, this is what you get. Joe Rogan is a menace. CNN is saying I'm taking horse dewormer. Yes, that's the deworming medicine made to kill parasites and farm animals. They must know that that's a lie. And we have to warn you, this is very disturbing to hear. Yes. Saying the word n***. Well, you've already said n***. D is just like n***. Just, just unbelievable. Hey, y'all. I'm going to leave a short message here about why I decided to... Why I decided to ask my music be pulled off of Spotify. So check this out. Saying the word n***. Well, you've already said d is just like This is what you get. You get people forming opinions on things based on campaigns designed to manipulate you into painting someone a bad person. There's a video that's out that's a compilation of me saying the N-word. It's a video that's made of clips taken out of context of me of 12 years of conversations on my podcast. See, now most people, after seeing this, would ask, well, what's the context? But then you have other people who say that context doesn't matter. He should never say it. Well, in that case, if it doesn't matter, then I guess my fifth grade teacher who said the N-word while reading The Kill a Mockingbird to us when we were nine is a racist. How did she get away with it back then? How did that happen? Oh, different times. Now the rules have been updated. Gotcha. So, so Joe Rogan referring to the title of a Richard Pryor comedy album is racism. Got it. Because if you actually go through the clips and context, you'll find he's quoting other people. And he's also referencing the use of the word in conversation. But that, that doesn't matter to you, right? Well, what about jokes then? I mean, considering we don't care about intentions, right? We're going to go see Planet of the Apes. So I look on the iPhone app and it says, okay, take me to this one. And the guy goes, okay. I goes, is that in a good neighborhood? He's like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Guy barely speaks English. He takes us there. We get out, and we're giggling. Oh, we're going to go see Planet of the Apes. We walk into Planet of the Apes. <laughs> we walked into Africa, dude. We, we, we walked in the door, and there was no white people. There was no white people. We, Planet of the Apes didn't take place in Africa. That was a racist thing for me to say. So here's a million-dollar question. Do racist jokes make you a racist? If that's the case, then this guy must be a racist too, right? Now, Mick, if you need even further clarification, let The Rock tell you in Chinese. Uh-oh. Chinese? Ding bang, ding dong, he's don't go aye! You know, the same guy who supported Joe a week before these videos came out, but now says that he was not aware of his N-word use prior to his comments and have now become educated to his complete narrative. What narrative? What about the other Joe you supported? We already have a nigger mayor. We don't need any more nigger big shots. So based on your logic, you no longer support him, right? Because, you know, context doesn't matter, right? We already have a nigger mayor. We don't need any more nigger big shots. And what's your narrative? Is this part of it? Yeah, you're looking like a, like a bloated transvestite Wonder Woman ready to fight crime. Pew, 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 pew. It doesn't matter that you're joking, right? And who made you aware of Joe's narrative? Oh, Don Winslow, the author. Dear The Rock, you're a hero to many people. 
and using your platform to defend Joe Rogan, a guy that used and laughed about using the N-word dozens of times is a terrible use of your power. Have you actually listened to this man's many racist statements about black people? No, but we've seen your book, The Force, where you use the N-word throughout the entire book. This is... (laughs) This is the thing with these people. They don't actually care. When you dig through their life, you usually find they're a hypocrite. They're usually everything they say others are. And they pretend to care for other reasons, whether it's to come across virtuous or they just want to smear people they disagree with politically. or Like the people who resurfaced the Rogan clips. These three weasels. These are the guys that resurfaced the clip. It's some political group called Midas Touch. And they admit it. Our account has close to a million followers, and we retweet and amplify things that we agree with. Joe Rogan's being attacked now because he started spreading COVID disinformation during a global pandemic. Yeah, this whole thing goes even deeper. I I don't want to hijack the entire show with this, so we're going to talk about it all on the Patreon. The bonus segment today is going to be a deep dive down the rabbit hole, where these clips come from, who's behind it. it. You'll be surprised who's actually linked to this stuff, actually. Oh, And all you people complaining about sponsor reads on the show, one guy's like, do we have to go on your Patreon to get you to stop doing sponsor reads? Yeah, yeah, you do, actually. And I don't see you on there, dick. There's no ads on this show. And another another thing, none of these episodes are ever monetized. YouTube will never allow 45 minutes of me talking to be monetized. They always find something wrong. So if you see ads on this podcast, that's all going to YouTube. This is why I do the Patreon, so I could give you guys uncensored content the way I want to make it with no restrictions. So if you're interested in the rest of the discussion, get on the Patreon today. I've been putting out exclusive clips. The band clips are on there. We're still trying to figure out the Discord chat thing. It's all starting to take shape. While we're on the subject, here's the latest in everything white people do is wrong news. This is from NPR. Some white people may choose the yellow thumbs up emoji because it feels neutral, but some academics argue opting out of the white thumb up emoji signals a lack of awareness about white privilege. (laughs) Could you imagine? Why don't we want anyone else in the galaxy to come in contact with us? Do we do this stuff just to push them away? This is on purpose, right? Like if you were hovering over a planet, And that was the first thing you read. You'd say to your buddy in the passenger seat, yeah, let's keep moving. But because we're all stuck here, uh, let's entertain this. Let's let's pretend that this is a rational discussion. So, So what is it when everyone else uses the yellow thumbs up? Only other races can choose it because it feels neutral? Just not white people. They can't have that reason, right? I wonder if the Simpsons are aware of this. Is that why the creators made him yellow? Lack of awareness about white privilege? I mean, what are we doing? Academics are debating the color of emojis. If that's the case, being a C student is starting to feel a bit more prestigious. If you're a high school dropout, you should feel vindicated. They're going to start teaching critical emoji theory? Is that where we're headed? Christ. Anyway. I got a voicemail from an upset bad baby fan. Yeah, yeah, they're out there. Remember the Cash Me Outside girl from Dr. Phil? Cash Me Outside, how about that? Yeah, she's a rapper now with gold records. Not kidding. Yeah, I mean, you're not surprised, are you? The world's been upside down for over a decade now. Nothing should surprise you. But anyway, I did a video basically lumping her in with Takashi 69 Whoa, Vicky and the Island Boys, and I inducted them into the new Mickey Mouse Club for illiterate degenerates. Cause the comment all that shit did that make you in my no? And yeah, she didn't like that very much. I have a question for Joey B. Tunes. Were you aware that Danielle, also known now as Bad Baby, when she was placed in front of the cameras by her parents or mom or whatever, parent, I don't know, 
But when she was placed in front of the cameras on the Dr. Phil show that she was only 13 and drug addicted. Do you think that it's really okay to further victimize her, you know, at a moment when she was drug addicted? At a moment. You know, at at a a moment. moment. At a moment. I don't know if I could finish this now. At a moment. Once I hear that inflection in someone's voice. At a moment. It's like a scratch on a chalkboard. My whole body feels like it's being poked by needles. But I'm going to power through it. Go ahead. You know, at a moment when she was drug addicted and exploited. Do you think it's really cool to further exploit someone's really, you know, poor choice of words for the rest of their lives? Especially when they were only a 13-year-old. Oh, the poor millionaire. What a victim. You you must either be one of her family members or a degenerate who identifies with her. I mean, I know I'm not perfect. I'm sure that you said some really messed up things when you were 13. Now, that doesn't mean I'm defending her actions on the show because I'm not. And I'm not even defending what she has done afterwards. I'm only asking you, how do you feel about exploiting a moment in a person's life when they were drug addicted and still a minor? Do you really think that's cool? I feel good. I feel good about it. Yeah, I'm happy with my review of the type of kid who brings nothing but grief to society, okay? Now go enjoy listening to her music where she degrades herself, brags about circulating drugs in her community, threatening people with guns, you know, all the things good people are passionate about. Is that is that a good enough answer for you? Ah, these people. See, I can only take so much exploring this stuff because it's just so stupid. It's like my brain is saying to me, dude, you've come a long way since you were born. As your brain, I've been programmed to reject this type of information because it's a waste of time. Why are you trying to force this nonsense onto me? And you wonder why you get headaches. Well, I'm sorry, brain. I I just figured I needed to take one for the team and raise awareness to the level of stupidity happening out there in the world so that people don't fall victim to the pitfalls that are created by people who take advantage of this stupidity, push it onto our society, and profit off of it. It causes people to consume their time with this stuff, which ultimately leads to them neglecting things that matter in their life and makes them oblivious to what's really happening in the world. They're being put under a spell. I'm trying to break the spell. That's why I do this. I suffer so society doesn't have to. Here's one from David Morrison coming in from the Patreon. Hey, Joey. I was wondering, do you think society's going to fall further into degeneracy? Or will there be a point where people will leave the look-at-me lifestyle behind and start contributing to the world? David. If that last voicemail was a reflection of the way things are headed, we're free-falling, pal. (sighs) On that note, let's get to our guest. Snoop, you look like the California raisin that got hooked on heroin. (laughs) You look great tonight, though. Always well-dressed. You spend more time in the closet than Dr. Dre. I got to meet Michael Bloxon tonight backstage in hair and makeup. They were rubbing a charcoal briquette against his face. giving him some highlights, you know. <laughs> Michael, I don't know if I've ever seen anything quite as dark as you. I was afraid of the dark as a kid, and now I've grown up to realize I was just afraid of Michael Blackson. <laughs> Terry Crews calls himself a feminist, or as it's known in the black community, a bitch. <laughs> Paul Rodriguez, you were famous when I was a kid. What happened? Now you're the only Mexican I know that doesn't work. (laughs) (laughs) Relax, I only have so much time, I'm killing too hard. All right, my next guest is a professional ball buster. 
He's written for the Comedy Central Roast. You've seen him on the Joe Rogan Experience podcast. And you can catch him taking people's souls on his weekly live show, Kill Tony, every Monday at 8 p.m. on all podcast platforms. Tony Hinchcliffe. What's up, buddy? My man. How's it going? Good to be here. How are you? Good, man. Dude, Dude, first off, I got I to gotta thank you for inviting me to Kill Tony in Austin last month. I, I don't think I laughed that hard at a show from top to bottom in a long time. And, and, you know, my favorite part of the show was actually after the show, I brought a friend with me whose birthday was that night who wasn't familiar with the show originally. And as a gift, you told him he looked like Kiefer Sutherland with Down syndrome, which, which was a great birthday gift for him. Yeah, I was just being honest. I didn't even realize I was kidding. Like, that was just my actual analysis. Yeah, no, and and he appreciated that by not calling me since the show. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, I it's it. dude. I feel like I feel like Kill Tony is like the last bastion of true ball busting comedy. Considering how sensitive people are these days, it's like it's like one of the only places you could go where everyone in the room, including the crowd, actually understands the concept of comedy. Like, I I got to imagine you'd be a moron to be a heckler at that show. I mean, you have, you have a panel of killers up there that's ready to latch onto your neck and not let go. Have you had anybody you had to fucking handle? Not really. You know, people that's really- That's a great be- thing. That's yeah, a luxury. People, yeah. People behave themselves there because they don't want to be made to look like an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Excuse me. We have allergies. What happened last night? Got wasted last night. <laughs> But uh, yeah, Texas has these weird fucking weeds and whatever. Everybody always has allergies out here. Everybody's sneezing and has boogers all the time. It's something nobody told us about Texas. That's why we don't have to pay taxes like California. I, mean, I had to get out of there too. I'm, I, I think we're all kind of refugees at this point, you know? You know, that's another thing with Kill Tony is like we had to escape. Like we literally, they're at the when we were doing our last shows at the comedy store in Hollywood, we were doing it in the main room with zero audience. We were not allowed audience members. Oh, wow. Which for a show like that is fucking criminally insane. And we were all literally losing our minds. Like it was just getting weird at this point. It was like, we were making, it was like we were make believe doing a show and we still had sponsorships that we were reading. And it just felt like we were like, yeah, it just wasn't fun. The whole show's built to be in front of a live audience and have a lot of energy. So we escaped to Texas to be able to do it. And what a massive difference. I mean, David Lucas and I were talking about it last night because him and I make fun of each other a lot. You know, yeah. he's like a really funny roaster and we make fun of each other. He makes fun of me for uh, being gay in a thousand different ways every episode. And I make fun of him for being fat every episode. And we were going back and forth during yeah. the pandemic, during the Hollywood lockdown. And like, yeah. it's just, if red band isn't laughing yeah, or the couple band members and everybody's thinking of their own thing to chime in and everything. So sometimes you're not going to get those laughs and it's just silent while we're being yeah either funny or not funny. We don't even know. Yeah. Well, so. California is living in their own alternate reality right now. And they, they seem to have committed to that. Whereas yeah. the rest of the country has moved on and it's just kind of, it's kind of interesting to me. It's like, I, I say, let them, let them be that way. And, and you know what? I think what it does is it forces you to go where you belong. And I, and I don't, I don't agree with segregation. I don't agree with, you know, the divide that's going on, but at some point, I mean, when it gets so extreme like that, it's like yeah. you, you, it kind of like kicks you in the ass a little bit. And, and, and it tells you, you know what, I, I do got to kind of pack up and go where I belong. And you know what? No one ever looks back when they do it. I don't know about how long you've been in right. Austin, but, no, but you never look back. You never regret these moves because it's crazy. It, yeah. Isn't it? Cause I, I feel the a, same way. Yeah. It's nuts. I'm up. I'm just hitting my one year anniversary right now of living in Texas. Yeah. And this entire year I've still had my apartment in Los Angeles at a great location. Yeah. It's fully furnished. My arts on the walls. It looks yeah. like I left there yesterday. Like, it doesn't look like I moved here at all. I barely yeah. brought anything. I packed the back of my Corvette and drove it out here because I had a couple weeks of gigs with Chappelle and Rogan and whatever. Right. And, like, and then I just ended up, I'm like, wow, the food here is great. This is cozy. And then I'm here and I'm like, I'm going to go back to LA at any point to like back and forth. I'll, I'll, right. I'll do both. Yeah. And I literally, now it's been a year, the time flew by. 
And I spent one afternoon at that apartment this year. Like it's, I'm not bragging. Like it's stupid. Like I burn, I I burned through money. It's a bad business model and decision, but we also didn't know, like I never would have guessed that California was going to double down on mandatory vaccinations to go to the freaking grocery store and shit. Like, it's just completely the opposite of what's happening here in Texas. And I'm not some like right wing conservative or anything of the such. Like I was a proud LA resident for 15 years and to see what's happening there is crazy. I don't know who, what, I don't know what they're thinking. And um, I think it's going to cost the entertainment industry. It's definitely costing, going to cost them a lot of stand up comedy. It'll be interesting to see what happens in film and everything, but it seems like those people, it seems like the film and television industry is like on board with all the insanity. Oh like yeah. yeah. Like I said, it's like they've just committed to this alternate reality and they, and they think they're doing something. I mean, they might, might be doing something for themselves, but isn't it interesting how, when you go back, it's almost like going back in time and your soul tells you, it's like, no, no, I already did that. What, what are you doing here? It's almost like you're in limbo and it's like you just want to get the fuck out of there. Now that you're in Texas, I got to imagine that the audience is also less sensitive because I feel like that kind of goes hand in hand with that attitude, right? It's a sensitive nature of people out on the West Coast. I mean, it's got to be refreshing, especially for what you do, being a roast comic, you know? Yeah. And yeah, people are there for that. Like they cannot wait, you know, they, they, yeah. are, they cannot wait to hear something sort of naughty right. and, uh, it, it brings them so much joy and that's what they're hoping for. Like fingers crossed, like they're there for yeah. the comedy. Sure. But they're really hoping to be like, Ooh, yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, then you, then you get people like Peng Dang, that little right. fucking twat. Yeah. I'll, I'll say it for you. I mean, it's, ha- it's how everyone feels about him. I mean, mm-hmm. for people who don't know, he was a Chinese American comic. And I, I say was because I don't consider him a comic after what he did to you. I mean, it, he, he, I mean, he, how did, how did it go? He, he would do your show, Kill Tony. I mean, I think that's where you first recognized him. He, he would get some laughs, mm-hmm. which led yeah. to you giving him, him an opportunity to open. Yeah. Him, pull them out of the random bucket. Any, anybody has a chance. The bucket of destiny will decide. I'm digging deep. You guys sure? One more time. All right, this is it. Put your hands together for your final comedian of this Fort Worth Kill Tony goes by the name of Pang Dang. Pang Dang, I like it. Yeah, he ended the show. It was sort of like funny and adorable. And, um, and you know, we had a girl come up out of the audience and make out with them. Pang Dang, you ever kissed an American? You've only been here one year. Have you ever kissed an American girl before? No, never. <laughs> Dude, I'm so Chinese, I haven't. He was just like the happiest little, like, you know, he couldn't believe it that this, you know, dirty little white American girl was shoving her tongue down his throat in front of a sold out audience after he got laughs. Like, you could just tell he was having the time of his life. Right. And so I asked him if he wanted to open up some shows for me. And when I came back to Dallas, he was like my third string Dallas opener. Like I have one guy and then another guy. And if those guys couldn't make it, he would be the next up, you know, on kill Tony, I was making Chinese jokes and Chinese. This he's laughing at all those things. He knows my sense of humor. It was, I was the, um, even on the day that he tried to uh, cancel me, I was still his, on his website as, um, you know, basically his main credit. Like you've seen him on Kill Tony. He's open yeah. for Tony Hinchcliffe. He's also done this, this hangdang.com or whatever it was. Anyway, you know, gave him chances. And then on a random Thursday Death Squad Red Band stand-up show, which I use as like a workout set, and yeah, you know, I, I called him a bad, I called him the bad word that you can call a Chinese person, I guess, during Asian Heritage Month, with that, which I had no idea it was Asian Heritage Month. And by the way, right. fun fact, nobody did. <laughs> nobody <laughs> in the world knew that. Well, meanwhile, his entire set was him trashing white people. Yeah. I uh, came to this country 10 years ago, went to college uh, in Alabama. Oh. Yeah, that's the correct response. <laughs> 
We invented gunpowder. <laughs> no Asians, no gunpowder, no gunpowder, no American Revolution. Wow. And all the white people in this country will still be talking quite like the British. <laughs> uh, and white people, you guys are the opposite because you guys invent shit, but you take credit. I hate it when the white immigrants act like they run the country. White people, your protest is more demanding. Uh, your chants are tough. Like, stop the count, storm the capital, hand my pants, Jews will not replace us. <laughs> that was left out of context of every media outlet, every conversation, conveniently. Did these people, it, it's got to be so frustrating when you live in a certain realm where people get it and then all of a sudden this little weasel goes out there and sends you out to the twitter mob the mainstream mm -hmm. crowd and then all of a sudden all the people in the world that that wouldn't even go to your show to begin with they probably don't even like comedy they all have an opinion and they all have right. a, uh, they're all experts on comedy i'm like what does that feel like to get that tidal wave yeah it's an interesting thing because 100 percent of the people saying things are not comedy fans and the people that are comedy fans that know what happened there also don't want to say anything yet immediately in those first few days because it almost seems like you're defending a racist right you know it's a weird fine line where it's like god the video clip does look terrible i yeah. agree that clip looks <laughs> horrendous yeah i couldn't believe it i woke up at 5 a.m that morning from like a weird, like, I remember it was like a weird nightmare. Something was like weird. It was like an old nightmare that I've had my whole life. Like once a year, there's this weird old <laughs> version of my house. Anyway, I woke up at 5 a.m. that morning before he tweeted anything. This is like four or five days after the show. Yeah. And I never thought about that show again after that, by the way. There wasn't there wasn't like, ooh, I did something naughty at the at the Death Squad show last Thursday. I hope I don't get in trouble for that. I never thought about it again. Yeah. I never thought about it when it happened. I'm not like, oh, I should talk to Pang Dang. I you know what I mean? Like it was just yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just a day at the on the football field. Right. And so I woke up at 5 a.m. and I I I did a thing where like I was, I just glanced at my Twitter and emails or whatever real quick. And there's yeah. like all these mentions of, that are like misspelled and like all these like <laughs> X's and I's and like all these things. I'm like, what is right. going on? Yeah. And I click and there, I end up sort of having to do some digging and I find that it's all tracking back to this video in Chinese, uh, in Chinese subtitles with like green outline. And I'm like, what is this? Like, yeah. this is me at the death squad show last Thursday. Okay. It's Pang Dang. And then me, and I'm sort of doing the math on it. I'm like, what the, f like, what's going on? And it's weird yeah. because a lot of things are coming in. Right. And it's all coming in from China. It's from Chinese people with zero followers, like zero tweets. It's all very weird over there. I don't know if they're allowed on Twitter, but they're not allowed to tweet or if they're only allowed to tweet about certain things. I don't know yeah. what the rules are over there. You know, who the fuck knows? But yeah. Anyway, so that's 5 a.m. And then I wake up again at 7 and it's there's a ton of them. And I wake up at 9 and there's even more. And then at about 11 a.m. that day, he must have woken up late. Maybe he didn't know that China was going to leak what he gave them first. Yeah. But then he tweets his thing. You know, I can't believe this is what I got. I, I brought up Tony Hinchcliffe the other day, and this is what happened. And and I'm reading the tweet and I'm like, wow, he captioned that wrong. Like he what i think what he meant excuse me <clears throat> i think what he meant to say was you know what an honor to be part of a comedy community where these are the types of jokes i'm so glad i'm in america right. where this is this can happen i'm so glad to be in texas where right. shows like this are happening like i'm literally thinking to myself well there's no way he's torching a bridge with me Right. There's no way. I mean, I've paid my dues at the comedy store. I'm a Rogan sure. guy. Like I'm on the honest side of, you know, 
stand up. I paid my dues. My peers know this. Like, yeah, it's and you just, helped this guy out, and you and you also he knew your comedy, and yeah. and you knew you knew that you were yeah. he knew you were a roast comedy. I mean, like, yes. it's not like he just just it was just a random opener. You know, like this right. guy was actually like part of your, you know, he, he was kind of like a coworker at one point, right. you know, where he, you saw him a lot and it's like, so of course this is probably the last thing you're ever going to think in your head that this right. guy's trying to flame you now. Right. I mean, literally last. I'm thinking to myself, it's just a bad caption. I yeah. was going to contact him. I reached out to him. My first move was Instagram DM. I was surprised to find out I didn't have his phone number. I kept trying yeah. to search. I'm like, maybe I didn't save it. Maybe I just kept yeah. searching pang and bang and fucking everything. Right. And uh, so I hit up uh, Jeremiah immediately who had had pang open for him. Jeremiah tends to, you know, if there's somebody from the Kill Tony universe, as he is also from that. Um, one of the, st- you know, former stars of the show, band leader, Jeremiah Watkins, uh, he, since he just started, uh, you know, headlining a lot more on the road, he'll take Kill Tony sort of people and have them open for him. And yeah. so I knew that he had Pang Dang open for him. I reach out to Jeremiah. I'm like, hey, uh, Pang Dang just did some weird shit. Yeah. Do you have his phone number? Right. And he reached back to me saying, I just asked Pang Dang if uh if i could give you his number and he said he doesn't feel safe giving it to you mind you this is now like it's still like 11 30 in the afternoon like this he fire feel safe oh my god oh my god this fire can be put out still like it's 11 30 right. on that tuesday afternoon yeah. granted it's blowing up in china this like they make it look like an american assault because of course uh, they have no idea what stand-up fucking comedy is out right. there so to them it just looks like yeah. a, a, a white guy calling a chinese guy a bad yeah. word basically anywhere i got right. treated that day like it was me on a uber video or in a restaurant me calling someone that not at all like a dirty comedy show on a comedy stage yeah. where it says that you're going to hear dirty things and recordings not allowed and um you know it was a real con job and you know an interesting thing is is that guy you know pang dang did so many interviews yeah so many he took every single one all those things are reaching out to me tmz and this and that every yeah. single thing's reaching out to me i don't know how they're getting my number like the whole thing is scary what was behind this i mean was this a comedian trying Have to be had funny any... trying to be edgy trying to be racist uh, no i do not know his um attention behind this um but i can tell you this um I've been in this country, I'm from China, I've been in this country for almost 11 years. I lived in Alabama, Georgia, Texas, and I had never heard anybody call me that C word. Um, So I was very, very shocked when I heard it. But he was doing all the interviews. And I don't know if he's a little bit autistic or what, because he's like overly honest and sharing things that he shouldn't have shared. For example, one of the things being yeah. that he admits that he edited the videos himself. Interesting. You know, yeah, which is which which makes sense because it happened on a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, right. Tuesday. And by admitting that he edited the videos himself and added the subtitles and decided when it starts and when it ends, which by the way. Literally, if you if 15 seconds after that video ends, it, uh, you know, first of all, there's more audible laughs. And second yeah. of all, you literally hear me say to a lady, like, come on, lady, lighten right. up. I'm not being serious up here. I know that guy or whatever. Yeah. I say. yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, he admits to how he cut the interview, which is crazy, because by him admitting that he edited the video himself, He's admitting to putting the Chinese subtitles on it and leaking it to China. Oh. Like he's li- he literally gave that up. I don't think he realized that he was doing it. He didn't need to do that. Yeah. Like I could have I could have assumed that somehow they got that and they made that. And then they sent him a thing with English subtitles. You know what I mean? I mean, what did he think he was getting involved in when he signed up to be a stand-up comedian? Well, I mean, what did this guy think that the job entailed? I mean, is he does he think that comedians are some sort of activists? 
that are up yeah. there. And now, you know, he gets to trash white people. He gets to do his thing. Like, did he actually mean that then? Because obviously he's taken you seriously as yeah. if you hate Chinese people, which couldn't be yeah. further from the truth. I mean, you roast okay. everybody, including yourself. Everybody yeah. knows that's your job. But then here he is going on this rant about white people. And it's like, that guy would be better fit as like a customer service rep at a medical insurance company. He, he could just sit at his computer all day and cancel every white person's medical insurance, yeah. you know, give them bad advice and just try to destroy their lives. I'm, I'm sure that job would be much more enjoyable for him because obviously this job as a comedian has tortured him and he's doing media tours with the Chinese government right. media. I mean, like how, yeah. what a little fucking weasel that is. I mean, I mean it's I, just unbelievable it's in my pathetic. world. You know, more than I'm Italian, more than I'm from Ohio, more than right. I was a Californian, more than I'm a Texan, more than I'm a uh, whatever. I am a comedian. And to me, to see him do that, I just literally like my brain can't comprehend picking being Chinese over being an American right. comedian, right. you're living the dream. Maybe you're not at this level. Maybe you're not at right. that level, but right. you have a chance to fucking have an unbelievable life I know. and to throw that away, to identify as Chinese, especially right. when the guy admits in other interviews, again, the interviews kill this guy. He yeah. answers way too many questions. <laughs> this guy needed a fucking attorney more than anybody I've ever seen before to be like, oh, skip that one. I don't know how you grew up, but I grew up, I have a feeling we grew up similar where, you know, when you were younger, there was a sense of camaraderie amongst your peers when it came to busting each other's balls. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's like, that was just how you communicated, you yeah. know? And, and what it is, is I just feel that a lot of people like this guy that we're talking about, they don't understand understand or maybe they just weren't around that environment where where, where they're in a friend group where yeah. people poke fun at each other. I mean, if you're in a friend group where no one pokes fun at each other, exit the group. How could yeah. you even trust those people? Because they, they if they can't be honest with you when they're busting your balls, how are they going to be honest with you when they, when you know, if, if maybe they see something that you're doing that might cause a problem in your life. I mean, like that's, that's called being a good friend and it's also busting each other's balls. It's kind of keeping everybody down, uh, you know, down to earth in a way where nobody in the group is kind of like better than the other person or higher and mighty. It's like, we, we, we all know that we're imperfect. So yeah. it's like, I feel like when you goof on somebody, it's kind of like saying, I like you enough that I feel comfortable enough to pick on that particular thing. Cause I like you, you wouldn't do that to somebody that was like in line at the grocery store, or the bank, because you don't right. know that. But if you were to do that, there must've been some kind of rapport you had with that person to make mm -hmm. you want to start to pick on them. And it, that's how friendships and, and bonding happens. Well, yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, and that brings it back to the actual situation which was, as I call it, a perfect storm. You know, it was, uh, you know, a guy that I knew and I wanted to establish myself right from the get because he was being hacky on right. stage. He's literally doing the jokes that make me look like an asshole afterwards. <laughs> He's going, you know, you, you white people, you should be nice to us Chinese because we'll give you more soy sauce. Yeah, and I'm so literally upset. waiting to go on stage. I'm like, Hang dang, are you fucking kidding me? So are you, I haven't seen you in two years. You're doing fucking be nice to us. We'll give you extra soy sauce. I'm thinking to myself, holy shit, that's right. fucking like racist. Right. Like he's being racist. Yeah. But the whole thing was he kept saying white people so mean, white people are so mean to us. Right. And I think to myself, look, these, there's only one way for me to start this set. These people paid for fucking tickets to a comedy show. It's right. me. I, you know, they're going to pop when they hear my name and I'm going to fucking deliver. How about one more time for the filthy little fucking sheep that was just up here? All you fucking race traders are hooping and hollering. Oh, we make it a gunpowder. Oh, you want extra soy sauce? Oh, you borrow money from us? And you guys just eating it up, you fucking Yeah, you know, a lot of people said during that thing, what if it was a black guy? And yeah. the reality is, is that if it was a black guy that I was friends with in the comedy world, 
Yeah. And it was that type of night and that yeah. type of show. Mm-hmm. And the last five minutes of their set, they were literally going, white people are so mean. And right. I made the executive decision after 15 years in the business that I think I can get away with this right now in yeah. this room where recording yeah. is not allowed. Yeah. Fuck yeah, I do it. Absolutely. And for because not everything is meant to get out. And by the way, my goal in that, obviously, if I were to say that word to a black comedian who, yeah. again, I'd have to be friends with. I mean, there's no it would again, it would have to be a perfect storm. But my goal there would be to make them fucking fall off the stage laughing on their way off. You right. know what I'm saying? Like, make it a part of the thing. If it doesn't hit with them, then I fucked up. Right. I was expecting Pang Dang to be laughing at the jokes that I was making. I thought he would have been the first to go. Oh, right. it was it was sort of fucking hacky. I shouldn't have done all that white people so mean stuff. I knew Tony Hinchcliffe was next. I know what he does. Right. Well, the common denominator is like you said, it's like you got to know the person. You got to know the person and they got to know you. And it goes back to what we're talking about, about this camaraderie amongst people. It's not like it's just some fucking random person. Right. I mean, you know, it's it's like, you know, that that's the thing that, that irks me is that you ha- actually, the fact that we're even having this conversation bothers yeah. me. The yeah. fact that we have to explain this, like, 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 like this is elementary school, like, okay, this is why we said this and that, and th- this is what a comedian is. I, I just think it's sad that you have to defend yourself like this. I mean, it's like, right. it's, it's like people think everything you guys say is gospel or or something. Yes. If they're offended by something you say, they automatically they they apply this idea that there's this ill intent behind your words. You're yeah. you're a fucking court jester. You're up yeah. there to entertain. You take a step outside of society, find <laughs> humor in things that are generally not socially acceptable to talk about in a public setting. You're not an activist. You're not running for office. You're trying right. to make people laugh, and yeah. now you're crucified for for just that. I mean, how awful is that? I mean, like you're an entertainer. You're literally, we get off on making people smile and laugh and make people uncomfortable and whatever it takes to get people. And then it's like, but then the world hates you because not the world, but those kind of people, you know, there's enough people out there in positions of power that can affect your life. And you lost an agent. I, I, right. I mean, like, I mean, like there, there was a ripple effect that happened because of this. And at the end of the day, all you were doing was trying to make somebody laugh and, and you were rocking the boat and, and it's like, but you're punished for it. That something's just completely upside down with this planet. If that's it was a horrible acceptable. It was a horrible few days, and yeah, uh, you know, losing the agent was super weird because I'm uh, like, wait, what? We were we've been, you know, what? Yeah, I don't even I don't even get it. Yeah, uh, and and that happened very early on, and you know, they're a massive corporation that fucking right. you know, I mean, they're a conglomerate now. WME, yeah. IMG, UFC, the whole fucking, right. the whole thing. And wow. so I sort of, I, I got that. What's wild is that everything increased. The audience is more excited. I'm selling more tickets than ever. Everything's better than ever. And that's a weird thing that's starting to happen that people are going to eventually find out is that, you know, what ends up happening. And I think this happens a lot with like Rogan, for example, somebody who yeah. really gets canceled, uh, you know, once, right. once, twice, three times a week or whatever the fuck <laughs> right, now, right, right. is they are driving people. And this is, this is backfiring on them. They're driving people to these shows and yeah. they're going, you know, you know, look at what he said here. And then people, a lot of people go, Oh, yeah, well, I'm going to find other stuff. He said, I'm going to get a viral clip off this. I'm going to fuck yeah. it. And you know what happens, dude? They get addicted to the show. I swear <laughs> to God, it helps his numbers every time. It helped yeah. our numbers tremendously. Yeah. yeah. Um, we're, you know, we're sold out until the end of 22 on a Monday show that seats 300 people at $30 yeah. a ticket. Like that's fucking crazy man well what's cool about it is that it's kind of what you're saying is that once it's brought into the mainstream the people who are upset 
like you said earlier, they're not even fans of comedy to begin with. But they're all, it's almost bringing in attention to the yeah. pockets of people that might not have been familiar with you guys also. Right. And, you know, another thing that it did is it made everything more fun and it made everybody have to prove themselves. I feel like me, Shane Gillis, Ari Shafir are three guys that all, when this happened to us, were like, wait, we just got in trouble for making a joke. It made us all, it's sort of like how when you start stand-up comedy, you want to like, you want them to get to know you a little bit so that your style a few minutes later works. Well, now all that's out the window. Now they know what they're about to see. Like, oh shit, this guy is dangerous. He might say something bad. It's just like a movie, you know, they do it, they sell it, they try to. God, I've always wondered what it would be like if Anthony Jeselnik's ball sack did comedy. And uh, I'm pretty sure we're finding out right now. Christian, the only thing I think I've seen you in is a Charlottesville rally video. <laughs> I, think they're, I think they're pulling a lot of people into stand-up comedy accidentally. Obviously not people over in China that don't understand the jokes or the timing or the beats or the... Uh, premises or the anything like that's yeah. what's really wild is that I don't yeah. think America realized that China has no idea what is going on there at all. Like yeah. we take our freedom and our arts so much for granted that we cannot yeah. fathom that the biggest country in the world has no idea what's going on there. They don't have that. They don't have that type of thing. They don't have that luxury that we totally take for granted. You know, people think, oh, I got a Magoobies. I got to go bananas. Yeah. So they must right. have that everywhere around the world. And it's Not a true. it's a sad day when these people sit down and find out like, whoa, we are the luckiest here in America. And right now, especially in places like here in Texas and, you know, wide open. I'm sure South Carolina is fun. And like, yeah really it's like even not even just america anymore it's starting to even get smaller these pockets of complete freedom and fucking rock and that, roll that's why i think california should just be its own country mm -hmm. any any like and just have their own president and yeah. leave everyone else the fuck alone it, it's like i mean it, yeah. it's sad that it has to come to that but i really believe in that like like have it like europe where they're all different countries because we yeah. can't what are we going to do we're just going to do this tug of war for the rest of our lives and, and get a president, a Democrat in, and then Republican comes in and erases everything the Democrat does. Vice. It's, we, we're just constant. It's like we're on, we're in limbo all the time. And we're, it it's is. a bad, it's like, I'm just over it. That's yeah. why I'm content where I am. That's why you're content where you are. And it's like, I don't have, I don't want anything to do with New York or California or all those politics and all that crazy. Just leave me the right. fuck alone. But look, yeah. dude, before I let you go, there, there's yeah. one thing, um, about you that I'm extremely jealous about. And it's not going to be what you think. It's the fact that you got to sit in on an interview with the undertaker. Yeah. That would be the highlight of my life, let alone my career. I was the biggest pro wrestling fan growing up as a kid. I so when I me saw too. you there, yep. I was like, that's me. I was like, I, this fucking guy, I'm like, I should be sitting there next to that guy. Yeah, I mean, that how was, did, I mean, that must've yeah. felt like being a kid in a candy store, huh? hundred percent. So I'm opening for uh Chappelle and Rogan at one of these amphitheater gigs here in Austin. Yeah. Yeah. And uh Chappelle's manager, a really cool guy named Cena, who um, yeah. literally has met everybody. I'm sure he has yeah. pictures with every U S president, every, Every single person that Chappelle meets is through him. You know, yeah. I mean, anybody that wants to meet Chappelle at the tippity top of the world. Right. And I uh, always remember there, there was like a big outdoor green room, like a way too big green room with food trucks and everything. And like, yeah, it was just insanity. And it's like day three or four of these shows that we're doing. And uh, I walk in and Cena who's never starstruck comes up to me and goes, you fucking see who's back there. And I'm yeah. like, immediately I'm like, he's never this excited about anybody ever. This is weird. Right. He, this has to be, I couldn't even fathom. Yeah. Cause I'm, I'm like, maybe it's like Obama or you know <laughs> Snoop or, you know, somebody cool as fuck. But right. 
when, when I saw there's like this group of eight people like yeah. 20, 30 yards away. And there's one man towering over everybody. And I'm like, you gotta be fucking <laughs> kidding me. Here we go. This is the dream. Right. Uh, uh, and yeah, when I, re- I immediately realized, holy shit, I'm about to perform for the undertaker. This guy's been performing yeah. for me for 30 fucking years. Like this was I learned about death from this guy. Right. Like I didn't know people went into coffins. I didn't know what happened. <laughs> I didn't know you got buried when you died until I was fucking seven or eight watching this right. guy do it. Isn't it funny how like you could meet the biggest celebrity in the world, but for some reason, if you're a pro wrestling fan, it doesn't compare to meeting some of these guys or seeing them in real life. I think it just has to do with like them being these larger than life characters when you were a yeah. kid and to see them as an adult, as like a real person. I mean, your, your, your head would explode if you were in a room with that guy as a yeah. kid, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you don't even look at him like, Oh, like he's a real person. He's they're like comic book heroes. I mean, I was at the 1992 Royal Rumble. Oh, wow. Remember. I remember that one. Ric Flair win that one? Yeah, dude. That was like <laughs> one of the best ones ever. Is that I, in Jersey? It was in Albany, New York. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Albany, New York. I was way up at the top. And I just remember seeing – this was the first time I ever went to a wrestling show, and it was that one. And, wow. I mean, my head was exposed seeing all my heroes coming oh, out. I mean, like – but just looking at them – from afar, it's like they you don't look at them like people. Like these are real yeah. life cartoon characters. Yeah. There's just something about that world that doesn't even compare to meeting like a fucking president or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know what it is. It's just I don't know. I think it just it takes you back to a time where when you watch that, there was no care in the world. There was no negative aspect to watching professional wrestling. And I'm sure there's people that are indulged in other things like comics or right. anime or whatever. Yeah, that's that's what I tell people. No, yeah, I tell everybody that if you're not a wrestling fan, doing the podcast with The Undertaker is comparable to doing an episode of Rogan in which Mickey Mouse is the guest. <laughs> like the actual right. Mickey Mouse from... <laughs> Then he's lived his whole life being Mickey Mouse and he has right. to stay away from people and not be in public that much or else everybody's like, holy shit, that's fucking Mickey Mouse. Like, I can't right. imagine. Yeah. I cannot imagine. <laughs> and I hang out with Rogan all the time. I cannot right. imagine what it has to be like for The Undertaker. Every man has to literally be, wait, how do I? Oh, fuck. Like, it has to be so quick, the yeah. turnaround, because he looks like the fucking Undertaker. Right. So Thank there's you. no like, <laughs> I don't could, know. How could to you imagine it. though, back in the day? I mean, speaking of, you know, talk about pro wrestling and cancel culture. Could you imagine if they had some of the characters they had back in the day now? Do you remember a- Akeem, the African dream? Do you remember him? Yeah. He was a white oh, dude yeah. from Georgia who wore yeah. full on African garb and yeah. would come to the ring walking like he was rapping with his hands and call, call, there's no white man in the world named Akeem. It, right. you know, it, it's like a Chinese yeah. guy named Mortimer or something. Yeah. It doesn't exist. He'd, he'd <laughs> talk with a fake accent. You, yeah. you, yeah, I mean, you'd have the, the big boss man. He was a cop who would beat his opponents with a nightstick as a good guy. BLM yeah. would be protesting him today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're right. If they listen to some of the things that The Rock used to say and Cena used to say in the Attitude Era, I mean, even John Cena, my God. Who's now, you know, super mainstream and apologizing to the Chinese in Chinese for calling Taiwan a country. Suspicious. What the fuck was that, by the way? I don't know what that was. Here's the thing. Nobody, nobody cared back then. And it was directed to kids, you know, because it it seemed like society knew that these were cower characters. It's not real life. I mean, you had like all these African tribal characters, Kamala. They they couldn't even speak properly. They got moons and stars on their belly. 380 pounds from the jungles of Uganda. Kamala, the Ugandan giant. He wants the freedom of the jungle. And there's only one way to do that, and that's to get the giant. Uh-oh, you what's know he, What's he doing? That means the dinner bell's ready. He's hungry. And when he's hungry, he wants to eat. And it doesn't matter what he eats, where he eats, or when he eats. 
as long as it might be something like Andre the Giant. Tatanka. Remember Tatanka? Yeah. What, I mean, like, oh, yeah. you, you could imagine Vince McMahon creating that character and, oh, and yeah. he's got a, or I got a Native American wrestler. Well, what, do, what do you people use? Uh, tomahawks here. Hey, we bought one for you at the flea market. Use this. Yeah. Uh, do, do a rain dance or something when you get in the ring. It's like, these are just characters. These are characters. Ladies and gentlemen, Tatanka! Hey, Yoni, can you grab that belt for me? Yeah. I can show Joey. So here's a cool thing is the um, Joe gets so much shit given yeah. to him all the time that he yeah. literally has nothing that he can do with all of it. Yeah. So the Undertaker gave him this belt, Are you which is heavy, me? heavy as fuck. Dude. And... Uh, dude, that's the champion. That's the fucking belt, dude. Yeah. Yeah, this he is gave, the best he, part right he here. He gave that to you? Yeah, he gave it to oh. Joe, as you could tell by the uh, by the signature oh, there. dude. To Joe, great getting to know you, bro. Thanks for having me on the show. Rest in peace, The Undertaker. Dude. And I, I, fucking... and I love it. I love that it's to Joe and not to me. <laughs> dude, I couldn't be more jealous right now. I think we're going to end the interview, actually. <laughs> I mean, get, get the I fuck can't... off of my show. I can't describe how heavy this belt is. It's ridiculous. I could only imagine. Holy shit. It looks a lot bigger than it does. And, you know, while those guys are large, you know. Exactly. Yeah. There's all six, seven and shit. The spirit of the Undertaker lives within the soul of all mankind. And, you know, the two things tie together, this pro wrestling and cancel comedian talk, because obviously I, I, I always forget to say this. Like, it's something yeah. that some of my, you know, closer friends are like, well, just remind them that you're a pro wrestling fan and that you like <laughs> playing the heel. And I always forget to mention it, which I shouldn't. Yeah. I should remember that. But in reality, that's another important thing to remember is like, that's what I was raised on. I look yeah. at you know, all these guys go on, go, they go to a city. This has always been my style, man. Right. You know, is like, wow, good to be here in Albany. What a shithole. And then yeah, right. start roasting the city. And yeah. like nowadays, what are you going to do? Is someone going to go, this asshole came to our city and said that he, uh, like, what the fuck are you people talking about? Like, I come from such a background of not only was I raised on pro wrestling to yeah. replace the time that my father wasn't in my life, but the heels on pro wrestling were my everything. I wore a yeah. Ric Flair t-shirt last night to kill Tony to work. Yeah. All of those guys. I have two Ric Flair shirts. I don't even have any other man on any of my shirts, but I got two Ric Flair's. I got right. the undertaker belt as the, one of the centerpieces to my living room back there. <laughs> you know, I mean, like this was my everything more than any comedy show. I think a lot of people get confused. Like all oh, the comedians, they must've just watched a lot of comedy coming up. It wasn't that right. way. Yeah. It was fucking pro wrestling. Granted it's hilarious. And, and definitely in the attitude era was a comedy. Like to me, it's not a diss to make fun of shit. Like that's just yeah. natural Absolutely. every week, every Monday, every Saturday morning, every Tuesday evening, sometimes Friday evenings, yeah. sometimes Sunday mornings, you would see people show up to a city or make fun of their opponent. And that's just what they did. And in stand up comedy, I've always been that way since day one, literally, since the first time I ate it in the original room of the comedy store. I've always been one to be like, you know, I like making them laugh. That's important. But I sort of want them to get mad at me sometimes. I want them yeah. to go, oh, or not, you know, not like a disgusting way or just sort of like, ooh, You're right. And then right. make them laugh. Like I like working those different, you know, beats to it i think just making people laugh or just right. being silly is sort of boring and easy i think I, I like i like losing them and winning them back over and watching someone get sort of offended but of course they laugh about something else later on that they that doesn't offend them even that pang dang set even that night that happened and you know one of the interesting things is, is he never he didn't know when he was doing all those interviews that uh 
that we had the full video of both sets. He never knew that, which is mm. hilarious because it's what stopped him. He stopped sure. the presses. He was going to do interviews. Really? He was going to go forever. He had things scheduled. He had some interviews, one of them with a hugely prominent one, either NBC or CBS, that he literally asked them to not air. Please stop. And all of these requests to stop, the full stop happened on Thursday night when the full video was released on YouTube and he realized, oh, fuck. Like yeah. he thought he was recording his set. He didn't know that, <laughs> you know, we had just in case of fucking super emergency yeah. videotape sets that come in from the back of the room. It just shows how dishonest the guy is though. Mm -hmm. The fact that he just cut it off when, when reality yeah. was about to be presented. Yeah. I mean, how disingenuous do you have to be? I mean, like, right. and let me just tell you, even though you, even though you know this, like you, uh, coming out with the video that you made when you did, um, nothing but balls, my friend. And, you know, I didn't know, uh, much about you before that yeah. at all. And, what an unbelievable first impression in a world where, you know, it, 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 it just takes an incredible amount of common sense and just common, common decency to do something like that. But it's such a rare, the, the words common make it seem like a lot of people are like that and they're not, it's actually a rare thing now. And you, uh, and a very dark week brought, I'm like, oh my God, this guy sees. So, yeah. you know, an, an amazing, amazing stuff on your part. And, you know, that was sent to me by, by Joe himself, by red band. Like, they're like, did you see this? And, yeah. and it, and, and, it, and it really, really made me feel good. So thank you so much. What a great I, first impression and a cool guy you are for doing that. I appreciate that, Tony. You know, it's like, you kind of hit it on the head is that, you know, I kind of, believe that if you stand for good there's nothing to be scared of and i think that a lot of people have a hard time expressing themselves um especially when it goes against the grain or might be an unpopular opinion especially if the world's coming down on somebody um you know like they were coming down on you but i feel sad for some people that have jobs or they have, they're in social circles or family units where they can't actually be themselves because they're scared of some kind of backlash right. from people that might not even understand what they're talking about, or they might not even have good intentions themselves. And that's why I just, it's that cliche, like the truth will set you free. It's a cliche for a reason because it stood the test of time. And I find I get a lot of people that, you know, express to me that watch me and they go, Hey man, they're like, I can't believe like you're out there and you're saying all these things that, that, that I believe in and I can't say, but here's the key I, that I see all the time. I can't say, and I go, why right. can't you say that? Because yeah. it's because you're, 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 you've been in, you've been mentally enslaved by your environment. Yeah. You know, I, guys like us, I think have more of a luxury to express themselves because our jobs are so unconventional, you know, and, um, we don't typically get that backlash from our peers because we're in a different industry. You know, you're in a different industry as mine, but it's still, it's still comedy in a sense. And we're yeah. still, you know, we have that freedom. We don't have a boss hanging over our shoulder and not telling us what to do. But I think because so many people are strapped and muzzled in that way, it creates an outlet for these people like these peng dangs mm -hmm. and then to to actually empower themselves and then you got people in positions of power who feed off of that mm -hmm. and 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 then the silent majority stays silent because they're strapped to their job or their social and it's like guys speak the fuck up and defend this guy that's why when i'm looking around i'm like who's like i gotta do this yeah. you know and i know other people did i'm like these people don't right. like tony doesn't know who i am joe doesn't know but it's like right. you know and i sent it to joe i go this is for tony man because it's like i'm not even seeing a lot of people standing up and it's like right. to me 
you know, to get back from you, to hear from you and Joe and be like, hey, man, thanks for doing it. Like, dude, that means a lot. But mm -hmm. I, I'm upset that I had to make that video right. is what yeah, I'm absolutely. saying. I hope to God we look back at this and be like, what a ridiculous time to live in. Yeah, you people know? are going. People are looking for that escape already. A lot of the people coming every Monday to all these shows are traveling. They're flying in from yeah. all around the country, Portland, Seattle, yeah. New York, uh, yeah. everywhere to escape. They're like, we're so happy. This has been the best yeah. week. These have been. It's been so much fun to be with a real audience. Be out. Yeah. And uh, be able to, you know, hear some fucking dirty shit because a lot of the clubs <laughs> are booking. Yeah, man. You know, the, a lot of the clubs are trying to go woke, too, and it is uh, not working out for them. You know, the clubs yeah. have tried to book Pang Dang a couple of times and they're surprised that he's not selling tickets. A couple of these. Uh, <laughs> oh, what a surprise. Yeah. <laughs> and imagine yeah, the Jesus. people that do buy tickets. You know what I mean? Oh. Those people that are like, oh, I want to go see that victim. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Dude, I appreciate you doing the show, man. Where where can everybody watch Kill Tony and what's next in the world of Tony Hinchcliffe? That's it. Kill Tony's out there on YouTube. I got a, uh, I'm going to announce a tour in the next couple weeks. Uh, going to get back out on the road, do some solo stand up shows. It's going to be a while before we get Kill Tony back on the road just because so many different places have so many different restrictions. And yeah, it's such a crazy show where people are sharing a microphone and there's a bunch of strangers up on stage. So it's like we're just going to wait until. Hopefully things get better everywhere to tour Kill Tony, but I'm going to be doing, you know, long stand up shows and got a lot of new material and fun stuff to talk about. I actually have stuff to talk about for the first time in my yeah. life and <laughs> instead of trying to talk about things like I right. actually have, which is another amazing thing that happened. You know, a lot yeah, of yeah. it. I mean, every single thing came out great yeah. in this, which is crazy because yeah. yeah. There was a moment in early May where I'm thinking to myself, am I get, am I about to be a fucking like salmon fisherman in Montana? Am I going right. to like teach people how to drive boats? Am I going to become a private airplane pilot? Am yeah. I going to, uh, you know, and I'm not too seriously, but I'm thinking to myself, like, should I start a restaurant in right. Wyoming? That's a pretty place. There's like animals, like, you know, yeah. there's a fail safe in my brain that was like, yeah. just in case. But anyway, it, it literally made everything better. The podcast bigger, the stand up a lot more fun. So, yeah. you know, what, what seemed like, uh, what seemed like the dark was it's always darkest before the dawn or something. I don't know. That's a yeah, weird way to flail things. out there. <laughs> well, on that note, guys, go see Kill Tony. You're the man, dude. Thank you. All right, brother. I'm sure I'll see you again soon, brother. Thanks, bro. Bye.